Hello, this is Carlos Pascual, and welcome to this edition of Sierra Week Conversations by IHS Market. This has been a series to bring you exclusive insights on politics, technology, energy, finance, how they combine together. And in today's session, we want to bring you a, a, a special interview that I did with a PBS NewsHour award-winning journalist, Ryan Chilcote. And what you might expect is that for the Citizens Energy Congress, a discussion that was we were having on the geopolitics of energy transition, that we talked about climate change, energy transition, the geopolitical issues that are related to it. But what was particularly striking is the way that it pointed to the impact that these two issues, energy transition and climate, are having on the definition of political and economic leadership for the 21st century. And I'd like to be able to share that with you. Please join us in the conversation. Thank you very much, Edna. Carlos Pascual is the Senior VP for Global Energy and International Affairs at IHS Market. He has been uh, an envoy for the United States government for international energy issues. He's been the ambassador to Mexico, where he joins us from today, uh, to Ukraine, and he has sat uh, on the National Security Council. Ambassador, thank you very much for joining us. I want to start by asking you, uh, to give us a sense of the magnitude of uh, what needs to be done to mitigate climate change. Ryan, first, thank you for welcoming me. Thank you for the opportunity to have this conversation. And you, you focus on a critical question to start with. What is at stake is massive because it's not just climate change. It's not just energy transition. It's actually reestablishing the foundations for economic competition and leadership in the 21st century. When we look at what's happening now and the movement to net zero, it's 80% of the world's GDP that's committed to this goal. 73% of the emissions in the world are moving in that direction. And so we know it's become irreversible and the challenge is how to be able to get there. The IEA report that was recently done is extraordinarily helpful to us. It lays out a pathway, but it forces us to ask questions. It tells us in the assumption that you have to take the world's largest renewable energy plant that's been built and build another one every day for the next 30 years. It tells us that half of the emissions in the world, we don't have commercial solutions yet. And so what it brings us back to is this question of how do you optimize the unknown when what it's at stake is not just the issue of climate and energy, but how you define the world, how the world is gonna economically, who the leaders are gonna be, what companies are gonna to need to do to be able to make investments to compete in that world. That's what's at stake right now. The rivalry between the United States and China seems to be gathering steam. How is that gonna play out? How big of a deal is that? Ryan, it's massive and it's no surprise. When you look at the tensions and the conflicts between the United States and China, it sets the foundation. But what is key here is a recognition that the leader in the future, economically and even politically, is going to have to manage this concept of economic competition in, in, inside of a co completely new context of what sustainability means. So if you look at it from China's perspective, it's a question of, how do you reduce your dependence on oil? And it's no surprise that China is investing more in renewable energy every year than any other country in the world, between 80 and $140 billion a year. China is investing more in the production of electric vehicles. It controls 80% of the production of batteries. And so the Biden administration comes in. It sets climate and energy transition as a goal. And what, what does it find? It finds that in order to be able to compete on these issues, it has to be able to compete with the investments that China has made in technology and leadership and export capacity. And hence, it tells us an awful lot. Why do you get a $6 trillion, billion, $6 trillion package of, of measures between the American Rescue Plan, and the Jobs Plan, and the Family Plan? Because it's all about this kind of transformation, and it's fundamentally affecting 
the way that both of these countries, the United States and China are seeing the future and what they have to do to advance their national security interest in order to be a leader in the 21st century. And can the two cooperate on mitigating climate change? Do they even need to, given the rivalry? Well, first of all, they have to cooperate because when you put this in a global context on climate, these are issues that don't recognize boundaries and borders, right? And so if you care about the impact that climate change has on your cities, on your agriculture, on your people, you have to cooperate with others because otherwise you don't get results. And with the United States and China being the two largest emitters, if you don't get them to cooperate, you don't get results. And the rest of the world basically says, why should we bother if the two big players can't play? So they have to do it. Can they do it? I think one of the issues is going to be fundamentally, can they recognize, can the world recognize that you can have cooperation in this area? And within that, there is going to be a competition for economic leadership. It's possible for it to happen, but one has to understand that there are going to be a whole series of other sur surrounding issues, the South China Sea, Hong Kong, uh, human rights issues with the Uyghurs that are going to that are going to have an impact on the way that these competitive issues are seen, and that process is now still playing itself out on how you can manage both this absolutely critical dynamic of saying we have to work together, United States and China, to set a foundation to get the globe to cooperate on climate change, and yet we will still have the ability to compete with one another to see who can win in the race for economic competition. Setting aside the China-US uh, rivalry, how do you see the move to carbon neutrality affecting geopolitics elsewhere in the world? Interesting question, Ryan, and, and it's massive. And it's not so much the end point. A lot of times people say, assume the future. We all have access to renewable energy. That renewable energy is in fact available to us, through the sun, through the wind, through resources that are directly available to us. The world is more peaceful because there's less conflict around these issues. The issue is really the transition to be able to get there. And there are going to be massive changes that we're gonna find with huge geopolitical implication. There are countries that are dependent on coal and hydrocarbon resources that are not gonna be able to have markets. How are they gonna compete and survive? And what is that gonna to do to their revenues? What happens with the production of oil in the transition process? We've already seen a certain villainization in the production of oil. If it results in less investment, in less production, and at the same time, how many people are willing to say, I'm not willing to get into my vehicle. I'm not willing to get on an airplane. Yes, it happens more, but travel and the use, the transport is still massive. So what happens in that kind of situation where oil supply cannot meet demand to have higher prices and greater concentration of those resources say in major producers like Russia and Saudi Arabia? Is it gonna be seen from a US perspective in its national interest? These are the kinds of questions that have to be laid out. And the issue really, Ryan, here is the transformational process to change. It, what, it's what happens in this process of transition when demand, supply, technology don't necessarily all line up. That's reality. And that's what we have to be prepared for, because if we aren't prepared to handle those geopolitical challenges as we go, those are the kinds of things that can cause us to fail. What do you make of the Biden administration's policies so far on climate change? I think it's been a phenomenal start, but it's a start. They've put together a team. They've made climate change the center of all of their economic activities. They're integrating it into their foreign policy. They're playing it as a team. They've put together the legislation that's necessary. But now comes the hard part. They have to get the legislation through. They have to get the resources to be able to do it. They have to mobilize action. And most importantly, they have to engage with the private sector in a way that the private sector feels that the signals are being set to drive investment in a way that is going to move the energy future in a way that is sustainable. That is a huge challenge because still what we have is so much uncertainty about the commercially available technologies that are gonna get us to net zero. And I think that's gonna be one of the critical issues that the Biden administration has to face, how to drive this into action that demonstrates results that, that penetrate the marketplace. Yeah, some of these greener initiatives uh, that the Biden administration uh, wants to champion 
you know, they haven't been particularly popular with Republicans. How does Biden handle that? I think there are two issues that are going to have to be fundamental is, first of all, the country is going to have to come to a recognition that we're in an inflection point, that this is something that is critical for economic competition for the future. And if we want to be able to compete in the United States, then we have to make changes that are corresponding to that. It, it requires investment. It doesn't just happen automatically. But the second issue is the China question, and it's been critical in the minds of legislatures. We recently saw a bill that was sponsored by Chuck Schumer in the Senate, received uh, 68 votes against 32 bipartisan support. And why? Because it was focused on establishing competitive capability with China. And it was able to bring together Democrats and Republicans on investments in research and development, the development of semiconductors. And I think this is a critical issue that's gonna have to play itself out. The US is gonna have to recognize that if it wants to be able to succeed, that it's playing a game of global leadership and it requires all parties to put aside the partisanship issues and recognize that this is a bigger question that is about what US leadership in the 21st century is about. Well, since you brought us back to China, let me ask you a little bit more about that. Because if you think about it, the Cold War in some ways contributed quite a lot to innovation. Do you see uh, this rivalry between the United States and China also contributing to innovation and how? I think it's already contributing to innovation. If you look at the question of supply chains, for example, when do you, have you ever thought in, in your life that a president of the United States in one of his first measures that he would take would, pat, would sign an executive order that says that we need to do a comprehensive strategic analysis of supply chains and how they affect the future? And that's one of the things that Joe Biden did. And why did he do it? Because there was a recognition that those supply chains are so fundamentally interconnected on the one hand with China. Secondly, issues like cobalt, critical minerals that are in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And what it's doing is it's forcing the United States to ask questions about what is necessary to innovate and compete on everything from supply chains to the technology for wind and solar to the technologies that we don't have, such as hydrogen, and how do we ensure that we are interconnected globally and economically to be able to make that a success. And it's not just an issue for the United States. Europe is moving in the same direction. And I can assure you that China is asking itself the same questions as well. So indeed, what is happening is this push for innovation. And it's innovation in technology, it's innovation in management, it's innovation in supply chains, and how you bring those together in order to be able to sustain the process of change that has to occur. And on that note, how do governments, uh, businesses, and investors cooperate effectively to foster this innovation? I think, Ryan, it is probably the most critical question that has to come out of COP26 when it occurs in November. In the end, the world has to come out of that, understanding that there is a commitment amongst governments to make fundamental change. But that fundamental change is going to have to require massive investments in research and development in a way that is applied to critical commercial issues and challenges, such as how do you produce steel and cement so that it has a lower carbon content? How do you ensure that batteries have the longest lifeline that they possibly can? How do you reduce the cost of the production of green hydrogen so that it creates a new competitive mechanism that can be used by industries all over the world? And to get that, you need cooperation, not just on the part of governments, you need industry to play as well, because what's fundamental here is that every industry is affected. Every industry must change. It must compete in a new environment. And the way that it's going to occur is that if capital flows on the basis of signals of what can be commercially available to reduce emissions. And that compact among government, the financial sector, industry, to be built so that it becomes fluid, not one that is resisted, not one that is a challenge on innovation, but in fact, there is a common perspective that there needs to be fundamental change and all three parties have to be part of it to succeed. Ambassador, thank you very much for your time. It was a real pleasure to listen to you. It's a pleasure to have the conversation, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.